Hello once again to my audience of Aether. I am Paragon Saber, and this is The Great Partition in Europa Universalis IV. To recap last episode, as I often try to do, we have Naples in war, uh, at war trying to take over Ferrara, but uh, has drawn in some heavy hitters, such as Hungary, trying to do so. Let's see. Uh, we had Brandenburg jumping on the last remnants of the Teutonic Order, that being the actually formerly free state of Danzig. ODF continues to expand at the expense of its neighbors, including, I think, Crimea. Zaporozhi trying to uh, make things happen against Crimea as well. Kasim spat out again by the ongoing turmoil in the region. Persia looking like the strongest state on Earth, having conquered up to the southern border of the Caucasus. But Syria giving him a run for his money, attacking the formerly supreme power in the Anatolia region, Karaman, and bringing them to bay. Actually giving back some provinces to Aretna, who had survived in Civis this entire time, just kind of avoiding notice. Saruhan got some Bulgarian lands and received some uh, Hungary-spawned Bulgarian separatists for their troubles. The Mamluks won a war against Ethiopia Medribari. The Protestant and Reformed Reformations have been going strong, though more the former than the latter. It is now the Age of Reformation, by the way. And Emperor Yan's mandate has gone the way of Ming's, so really, the mandate of heaven is anyone's for the taking, because that army is going to be squishy. All that said, of course I can't recap everything. Oh uh, yeah, France is almost dead. Austria's gonna eat them. And uh, let's go from there. So before I start uh, doing actual nation commentary, by the way, uh, and before I even do that, Corfu did actually take the province of Epirus in that war that Naxos fought for them. <laughs> uh, Epirus still alive down in Achaea. They've pretty much just inherited Achaea's spot in the world, really. Though they are hanging on to that alliance with, uh, with those alliances with Bulgaria and Crete. Not the most helpful of alliances, but, uh, you know, they can try. Anyways, what I was going to mention is that it occurred to me that this scenario actually somewhat like an inverse warp in the West, if you've uh, if you've seen the Elder Scrolls. For those who know about the Elder Scrolls but no, don't know about the warp in the West, uh, the warp in the West is the event that actually ended Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. And uh, what ended up happening there was basically when Bethesda released... Daggerfall, there were six different endings that you could try for, all of them revolving around the uh, the Golem, the Numidium. And those six people that you could give the Numidium to, including one where you could use it for yourself, those all ended up giving you different, different endings. So when Bethesda was trying to make Morrowind, they were faced with the problem of how do we amalgamate six different endings which give six you know completely different scenarios to move forward with and they decided to amalgamate them uh and basically said timey wimey akatosh things happened and uh basically all of the quabbling states of the high rock region consolidated into three kingdoms. The Bulgarian Separatists, by the way, ending up fighting Byzantium, and Byzantium winning this time, they'd have liked to have done that earlier. Byzantium actually managing to get up to Tech 9. Uh, they now have Basilissa Irene II Paleologos, a 4-4-2 with a 3-3-4 error. Their, uh, their dynasty looking decent right now, but they again, they really could have used that win over Bulgarian Separatists earlier. Uh, back to the warp in the west. Essentially, you know, a bunch of shattered kingdoms became three consolidated kingdoms. And this scenario, really the opposite. You know, a bunch of states that were looking quite strong, the likes of the Ottomans and France and, uh, and Ming, suddenly just falling apart and becoming a bunch of uh, squabbling microstates. Just thought that a, an interesting comparison. Could be that you just tuned that out, but hey... If you like the Elder Scrolls, if you like the uh, older games, it's an interesting event. Back into the action. France has, confirmed, been wiped out by Austria. Austria taking Orléans and Lyonnais. Really, uh, P 
beyond Austria's wildest dreams what they're able to accomplish here. Usually they have this big old, well, big blue blob blocking any expansion in the region if they do, even if they do get the Burgundian inheritance, and uh, this time able to parlay that into significant territorial gains, including great provinces like Paris, a 34. Uh, Franche Comte, they got in the original inheritance, it's a 14. Orléans, a 24. Champagne, a center of trade, uh, by clicking on that. Uh, a 22, really just great, great gains for Austria, and uh, they're showing that. They are the uh, second great power. Though those percentages do mean that colonialism has spawned, and judging by the 100% in England, I'm guessing it spawned up there. Let's have a look. Colonialism has spawned in Lothian, usually Scotland's capital, but uh, after some initial losses, England has turned that around and eliminated them. So uh, England, the first to embrace colonialism, I'm sure Clam uh, Clamor Card will soon follow, and uh, we'll see if it can get to the continent. Colonialism being one of the hardest in institutions to spawn, especially if it does spawn on England, because for it to spawn, you need some sort of adjacency with England, whether across a sea zone, so any of these people could get it. Uh, who is England rivaled? Castile, Brabant, and Austria. So perhaps Normandy is getting some, uh, some institutional spread from England, and possibly Brittany as well, but... If everybody over here has adverse relations with England, or rather if England dislikes all of them, then uh, colonialism just won't spread. And so the only way to get it then is to develop it into a province, which as a player, you want to do anyways if you figured out it wasn't spreading, but the AI, well, they'll develop their capitals. Maybe colonialism will spawn through something like that. Hungary almost full occupied by Nitra right now. Nitra presumably calling in the forces of uh, Poland, Lithuania, and perhaps Brandenburg as well, but uh, they had their cores, they lost their cores, they want their cores back, and maybe more in the offing. Nitra, a surprisingly stubborn tag as soon as you get them released. Uh, you'd think with them being squished between so many majors, you know, in a base EU4 game, Poland, Lithuania, or perhaps just Poland if they don't take the Jagiellian, uh, Bohemia, Hungary, Austria, you know, you'd think they'd be really a snack. But uh, a lot of the times that I've run these sorts of scenarios, Nitra has been surprisingly stubborn. Last goodbye to Galicia Volinia, who has had their capital of Volinia taken by Mazovia. Don't think they'll be wanting to let that go anytime soon. Mazovia, a really surprised power. Uh, they're at war with Silesia on halt, interestingly. Uh, but yeah, again, Mazovia really kind of a surprise power in this region. Of course, they usually start off as a vassal under Poland and are integrated by really 1460. I released them this time. They got some uh, pretty good alliances to hold off Poland, or maybe Poland was more interested in the Teutons. That's that, uh, definitely a thing as well. But regardless, Mazovia has parlayed that into being the nation that took most of the Teutons starting land. As a matter of fact, they have all of what the Teutons started with, aside from Chelmo, Tuchel, and Danzig. So, uh, Again, they are the big winners there. Muscovy at war with Novgorod. Figured that was going to happen eventually. Novgorod taking a pretty decent battle there, but they are now going to get squished by this great general, Nazari Rajevsky. And uh, the fall of Novgorod going to take place, but hey, they made it about 50 years past what they did in the original timeline. We now see Crimea almost full occupied by Theodoro. This is a lovely thing to see. Theodoro, a very difficult nation to play, uh, especially now after 1.21, the changes to alliances. I think Theodoro, at least in 1.19, they started with Muscovy friendly toward them, but sometimes that switched by day two. Uh, so even if they were able to get that, they can't just attack Crimea. Uh, they'd have to try to wait until Crimea is distracted. That usually just wouldn't work. Crimea is just too stubborn of a tag. They, they can... Pull armies out of nowhere, it sometimes seems. Great Horde taking a chunk out of Odeyev. That expansion stopped for the for the moment. Including uh, Poltava. Maybe not the greatest of provinces, but the site of a rather famous battle between the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and Russia in our timeline. Things looking pretty settled in Anatolia for now. No wars happening. Sarohan holding onto a really small army. Uh, but protected well by their alliance, mostly with the Mamluks, though uh, 
you know, Karaman still helps. Karaman still does have all of central Anatolia, including the pretty good province of Karaman itself, now a 28 development. Hamid, a 15. Kutaya, or uh, Kotiayon, a 14. Ah, Byzantium is at war. Byzantium's at war with Hungary? Byzantium, why are you at war with Hungary? Why have you chosen this? Because Hungary is looking very, very weak right now. That's why. Byzantium likely wanting to take a chunk more out of Serbia than Hungary itself, but uh, Serbia is still a junior partner, though now with 100% liberty desire. Hungary with no army to be seen, and uh, I'm kind of glossing over the main point, Nitra ate everything. <laughs> That's a bit of an exaggeration, but Nitra taking not only Pest itself, uh, they actually are calling it Pest Budin, though... I'm uh, aware that the city of Budapest isn't really thought to have come into being until the late 1800s, when the cities uh, over what I believe is the Danube were joined. Regardless, they also took every one of their cores back, as well as Pest, and uh, some of Royal Hungary, all of what used to be Transylvania. I mean, Transylvania still with cores there because of their culture, but uh, I said Nitro was a stubborn tag. Again... With these alliances, though they have lost their alliance with Brandenburg, but still. Poland, Lithuania, still the main powers in the region, and uh, helping out Nietzsche very much there. There has been a change in emperorship. Uh, not, uh, not in the tag, that's still Austria. But, uh, regardless, the name that is Holy Roman Emperor has changed. We now have Albrechtus. Albrecht the Sixth von Habsburg as the Emperor, a two-two-three, not the greatest of rulers, but certainly not the worst either. No heir for now, so we will see the votes changing. Seems like people are favoring Brabant as the Emperor right now. Should Austria fail to get an heir, and you never know, the Reformation is uh, in full swing. Let's see if that last Reform Center of Re Reformation has appeared anywhere, or if the game's just sticking with five this time. Uh, I'm still only seeing the five, uh, the Center of Reformation in the British Isles doing its work quite well, those in Frankfurt and Eger having a tougher time of it, but, uh, again, still a pretty strong Protestant Reformation. I mean, <laughs> managed to convert to most of Scandinavia without even having a Reformation Center in Scandinavia. So yeah, I'm not seeing a third Center of Reformation for the Reformed Faith, doesn't look like that's going to do all that well. I mean, even those nations that tried to, uh, or even the Center of Reformation itself in Barry, owned by a nation that still professes itself staunchly Catholic, that being Gascony. Gascony, <laughs> oh, this is great. Gascony is a junior partner of Nevers. <laughs> all these, uh, French nations having pretty similar dynasties. Wouldn't surprise me if they managed to pick up the same one every once in a while. And uh, Nevers, with five provinces, a lot better than the two they usually start with. Again, usually a vassal of Burgundy, but right now having picked up a nice, strong lapdog in Gascony, though uh, Gascony is not going to roll over their liberty desire at 82.4%. Nevers will have to sacrifice some prestige to do that, or even better, just expand. Toulouse, still free, still allied with Castile, which really means their position is uh, pretty much set as long as they'd like it to be. Though, uh, if Castile changes their mind about that alliance, these will make some pretty uh, good expansion targets for them. Speaking of Castile, they do have military tech 10, but nowhere close to the admin tech 10 needed to form Spain diplomatically, which will unite all of the Iberian Peninsula. Though not all of the Iberia region, as both Laborde and Roussillon considered parts of that region, to say nothing of the Azores. Definitely uh, can make for some not fun things happening in like an Albania or Iberia campaign, should you happen to forget that those islands need to be under your control, life can get tough. Byzantium doing very well against Hungary. It's just a dogpile on Hungary right now. Hungary's army stack wiped by the Byzantines. And, I mean, even Epirus is jumping in. You know, 
We've got Wallachia occupying some of them. We've got Bulgaria occupying some of them. It's just, it's a bloodbath for the Hungarians. And uh, we're likely to see a, a large shift in the balance of power over here. Hungary formerly looking quite strong. That alliance with Austria really deterring a lot of comers, but uh, not anymore. Zaporozhye has been reduced to a one-province minor in Yedison for a lot of this game, but really they've been more of a mover and shaker than you'd think. They start off with three provinces, Yedison, Ingil, and Zaporozhye, and they, they were tributary state of Crimea for a little while, uh, but as soon as they got free of that, they've been throwing around that 7k army and uh, really helping out a bunch of different tags. Ryazdan has expanded again, taking Yelesh, Tambov, and Atkara. They've been very stubborn. They've done well for themselves. Right now, allied with Kasim and Theodoro. They were allied with Muscovy. The fact that that's no longer a thing means that their days are likely numbered, though. Unfortunate, it's fun seeing uh, some strong Russian miners. Novgorod losing that war and losing badly, losing up to Novgorod the Great itself. So, again, their days most certainly numbered. City of Finnmark still alive. Can't help but wonder when Norway will come knocking again. Something notable, the city of Finnmark actually leading a trade league with Gotland. Uh, of course, city of Finnmark not being a tag that exists at the start of the game. They were a trading city created by Novgorod. Uh, I've actually uh, thought that it would be fun to have that as an achievement. Call it the, uh, a league of their own, you know, after the, uh, the women's baseball movie. Great film. Uh, have that where you release a trading city and it becomes the leader of a trade league. Usually they have to do that by getting another province so they're not eligible to be underneath a trade league, but, you know, I think it'd be an interesting achievement to have out there, give people some incentive to release those trading cities. Really, the only position I can think of where people might want to release a trading city right now is if they're uh, going for the Venetian Sea achievement. Venice not allowed to hold that thought. Austria's fighting Naples. Wondered if that might uh, become a conflict as soon as Naples edged up into that area. This war is the Austrian conquest of Urbino. Naples without allies. That's just... That's rough for them. Naples, formerly a great power, never got anywhere above 7th, I don't think, but had had most of Italy, at least in land area, uh, and now having drawn the wrath of the Holy Roman Emperor, going to see some of that progress crumble. Poland a great power again, Korea, Korea having dropped out, and actually Naples is the seventh great power right now, they just won't hold on to that for long. But uh, Poland back up, did Korea suffer some mishap? They did. They actually appear to have lost some territory to those Haishi Shepherdists we saw earlier. Rough for them. Uh, they can certainly recover, but... Well, rough for them. The mandate being zero means Yan is still the Emperor, but uh, that might not be happen for long. They are involved in four wars. How many of those are for the mandate? Korean Yan War for the mandate of heaven. Ming Yan War for the mandate of heaven. Yan War for Haishi Tribute, and Qi Reconquest of Laiju. So right now, it is the former Emperor Ming and Korea both vying for the Mandate of Heaven, though it is Ming that has that crucial occupation of Beijing. Turnabout, as I've said before, is fair play. Now that I've uh, remembered that saying, I'll probably use it far too often. At least I've cut off on the use of the word interesting, right? Oh, nope, there it is again. Down in the south, Lanzhong has been reduced rather far to the status of a three-province minor. Considering that they were allied to Korea that entire time, I mean, Korea was weakened. I don't know where their army went. Right now it's trying to gain the emperorship, but uh, regardless, Lanzhong not protected from the dastardly, dastardly plots of its neighbors, and Lan Na really the fellow to beat, as they have been for a long time down in this region. Lan Na allied with Ava and Mang Yang, those two enjoying the protection of their uh, fellow over here, and they do have Tonggu as a vassal. Khmer are also looking fairly strong. Uh, if they are allowed to grow, then they get some pretty strong troops. Maybe not Prussia level, not quite Space Marines, but uh, strong. 
Diviet out again, existing in the province of Hue, and Tonkin has just, they've just existed. They've just been over here. They're now guaranteed by Huai, this uh, kind of pastel-looking nation above them. Huai allied with Shi and Wu, so any attack on, well, really, Tonkin would be a good uh, way to get into China for Lan Na. Regardless, this area eminently consolidated now. Uh, the states of Yi, actually the only tributary, ah, a tributary state of Shi, actually. They used to be a tributary state of Yan, the emperor. And, uh, Ryukyu. Ryukyu secured a pretty good alliance, though, uh, don't generally see Ryukyu, uh, actually doing much if it's not a Three Mountains run. Anyways, we're looking at a clash of the titans between Huai, Shi, and Wu. Uh, Jin also a pretty good player in there, at least in land area. I think that area not nearly as rich as some of this in China proper, but, uh, you know, Jin might be able to throw its weight around as well, so. Mentioned that it's a redone Warring States period, I stand by that. You end up with, you know, three or four heavy hitters and, uh, see which one comes out on top. I have spent enough time over here at this point. Vigianagar, dead almost by this point. Reduced to only North Kanara as their capital and only province, Bahmanis, definitely winning the uh, Tale of Two Families at this point, though uh, I think they had a bit of an advantage from the start, really. Bahmanis ally or, uh, involved in a war against Malwa and Ahmednagar, so looking to expand their influence north as well. Madurai is still hanging on down here. They seem to have reintegrated Mysore and, of course, got their uh, self-named city and now capital back from Vijayanagar earlier. That said, Cochin's still around and protected by their alliance with Bahmanis, and they're actually uh, allied to Madurai as well. Maybe though, maybe we'll see a peaceful vassalization there. Uh, perhaps if Madurai can make some inroads into Bahmanis, or perhaps eat Ceylon, who is also protected and allied with Bahmanis Madurai. Still Theravada, so you know, Buddhist strike back a possibility. Byzantium gunning for Corfu. Uh, we did see that war with Hungary end earlier. I didn't comment, but Byzantium got nothing out of it. What really happened was Venice got richer, being given their cores on Zeta, Rosetta, and Leger, though notably not the one on Durazzo, which they actually start with. Not in this campaign. Start with Albania, this campaign. Uh, but regardless, Bulgaria taking Sofia and uh, Skopje back. And... Uh, well, that was really about it. Uh, actually, no. Wallachia managed to take uh, the remainder of its original provinces in Altinia and Tergavista back. So the dream for Romania is uh, still alive. Wallachia actually having or needing only Basarabia and Maros, but uh, Maros is especially going to be a tough one to get as Nitra strong, Nitra allied with Poland. And Nitra looking down on Wallachia, guaranteeing his independence. This war done over here, Austria taking a large chunk of Italian land from Naples. Will they see a coalition? Oh, I don't know where the aggressive expansion map mode is. It's not one I use all that much. I tend to just look at the numbers when I'm playing. Uh, I'll just check back on Austria and uh, see if they happen to have angered enough people for a coalition in the future. A lot of those people probably uh, holding down truces with Austria. Gascony still under Nevers and their liberty desire actually dropping. Surprised uh, no one's actually, well, honestly, they could beat Nevers probably by itself, though Nevers allied with Liège. The two of them could throw together enough troops to contest Gascony itself, but if anybody supports Gascony's independence, that union will end and end quickly. Morocco has, since the last time we looked at them, taken back all of his successor kingdom's land. Rather, uh, they're not successor kingdoms anymore. Morocco has succeeded itself. Uh, Tlemcen still around, still does have Tala Imsan, or Tlemcen itself. Uh, interesting bit of trivia. Tala Imsan, I believe, Arabic or perhaps Berber for the Dry Spring. Great, well, decent province. Uh, 14 development and a coastal center of trade. So, should Morocco come knocking? Which I'm sh Oh! <laughs> Probably should have looked at that. Never mind, Morocco has Clemson. Clemson is a vassal. 
Tunis allied with Mazav, which explains their continued existence. Fazan? Fazan, a vassal of the Mamluks. So, power pretty much consolidated in northern Africa. We'll see who comes to blows and when. Down in West Africa, Mali is about dead. They have drawn the wrath of Fulo, Kong, Jene. Maybe Sh Songhai was involved. Ashanti actually making an appearance down here. Uh, regardless, Songhai is still looking like the main power in the region, though I think it's really going to come down to who's going to win out of Songhai, Fulo, and Kong. Right now, my money on Songhai just because of uh, bigger blobs, but Kong does have a 1 6 general. Actually, no, that's Janae's general. Perhaps they could do well for themselves. Don't know how good a lot of this land is down here, though I do know that Songhai has Timbuktu, which is uh, one of the better provinces down in that area. Down here, it looks like some consolidation has occurred. Kuba has picked a side. Mentioned earlier that Kuba likely to be the kingmaker down here, and they have picked Kikonja. So Congo going after Kuba first, but we do have Kuba over here. Who has initiated this war? Would this be Kuba, or would it be Kikonja? That would be the Kuban conquest of Yaka. Perhaps Kuba looking to become strong enough in its own right to uh, become the guy down here. I mean, if Kikonja just lets him expand, then that could certainly be the case. Over in the Great Lakes region, not much has changed. I don't think any territory has changed hands, actually. The alliances? Rwanda still with Burundi and Nakor. I'm surprised Banyoro still exists then. They don't have any allies. Sofala has conquered everybody, as expected, though uh, have not taken down Moravi. Things looking to be set up for a showdown between Kilwa and Sofala. Kilwa holding on to greater troop numbers right now, but uh, Safala definitely having more gold provinces. Sakalava, the man in uh, Madagascar, on tomorrow, the only one left that's not Sakalava. Sakalava just has the strongest starting position in Madagascar. Uh, just hands down. Castile has colonized Cape. Cape, a great province. I think it might be the uh, most developed uncolonized province at the beginning of the game, though Manila is close. I think Manila has 14, but Cape has 15. And there we have it. The titans of the Middle East going after each other, Syria and the Mamluks at war. Anybody else involved in this? Yes, Syria fighting a lot of people, fighting Karaman, Saruhan, the Mamluks, and Fazan. Though, looking at this little border down here... Okay, so Syria backed up by Kandar and Mentessa. I almost want to sit here and watch this war. Regardless, Crimea occupied by Crimean noble rebels. Theodoro has expanded. Kaffa back... Ah, Trebizond exists again. Probably due to the Pontic culture here in Kaffa and Matrega. So these two provinces now under Trebizond, Theodoro holding on to Yerushkul, Crimea, and Theodoro itself, though Wallachia has something to say about that, as does Zaporozhi. Odiev allied with Theodoro, so where did this war originate? That would be the Odievan conquest of Yedison. Odiev trying to take out Zaporozhi and uh, not looking great. Though, that seems to be a good battle for Odiev. They've caught Zaporozhi's army alone and have defeated it. Definitely know where their return province is going to possibly be. Never mind, I thought they were going to stop in Yedison. Going all the way to Mansur instead, and uh, looks like Odiev's just going to let him go. Meanwhile, that would be Kasim fighting the Great Horde. What war is this? The Kasim Conquest of Great Horde. You go, little buddy. Great Horde with a full five provinces to Kasim's one, but that doesn't bother him. He has greater troop numbers, he has the will, he's gonna go for it. Muscovy getting closer to Russia's status, having taken Novgorod in the last war, but not doing all that much right now. Uh, they've had Yaroslavl as a junior partner for quite a while, 
actually fought a unification war with Novgorod over that earlier, you'd think that they might just want to, you know, take the province, because uh, when you get a personal union, you have to sit on that for 50 years. Makes some sense when you're getting a personal union over a major, but righty then. So that would be the timer. The year is now 1531. I'll take a glance at the great powers real quickly. Not much changing, but uh, some significant developments being Persia taking the number one spot, having embraced the Renaissance. Castile still in second, Austria third, England fourth, being the only one to have embraced colonialism, Muscovy fifth, the Mamluk sixth, Poland seventh, and Wu making a triumphant return onto the Great Powers list. And with their name reversed. Ugh, shield your eyes. Regardless, Wu in eighth. The mandate taken once again by Ming. Um, bold strategy, we'll see how it works out for him. Alright, that's enough of me uh, yapping on beyond the timer being done. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you next time.